All right. I hope you have a decision in mind. And with that, uh, let's get going. So I think this metaphor of climbing mountains is really useful because you could start to think about, imagine you're trying to get to the, the top of one of these peaks, right? And all of the different things you have to do to try to help make sure that happens. And decision-making in this process of climbing a mountain is obviously going to have a huge impact on both whether you get to the top of the mountain at all and how quickly you get there. And so to put this metaphor in terms of our everyday lives, you know, you have all these different goals you're trying to achieve, right? You want to get that job you always wanted. Uh, maybe you want to get a master's degree. Maybe you want to have a happy marriage. Or maybe you have even more ambitious goals, like maximizing global utility. But whatever your goals are, your decisions are clearly going to impact to a really tremendous degree, whether you get to them at all and how quickly you get there. And this leads me to the first decision-making mistake I want to talk about which is aimlessness. It's where you don't know what your goals are when you're making your decision. So basically you're trying to get somewhere, but, but you don't know what that place is. You know, imagine in the mountain climbing setting, you're like, yeah, I don't even know what peak I'm trying to get to, right? And how difficult it would be to make the decisions that you're gonna have to make. And so an example would be, should I stay in academia or leave and go work in industry, right? And for that question, you might wanna consider, well, what are your life goals? What are you actually trying to achieve in your life? So the solution to this is basically keep your goals in sight when you're making your decisions. All right, so we've got, we've got our decision-making goals, but how do we know that they're actually good goals? Like, should we try, should these be the goals we're trying to get to? And this leads to the second big decision-making mistake, which is that sometimes we get, we actually achieve our goals and we realize there's just trash at the top of the mountain. You know, that peak that looks so beautiful from far away is actually not something we really want to achieve at all. So this is mistake number two, uh, which I call misdirectedness, which is where you're not aligning your goals with your deeper intrinsic values. And so for example, you might have the goal of becoming a doctor, uh, but then after spending eight years getting into medicine and you're finally actually treating patients, you realize that this life isn't actually the life you wanted. It's not actually meaningful to you. Yes, you achieved your goal, but you didn't achieve the things that you value. The solution to this is to really know your intrinsic values. These are the things that your goals should actually be aiming at. We spent a lot of time studying people's intrinsic values. We looked at what philosophers say about it, political scientists, psychologists. We also ran our own study where we put people through a little mini training program on intrinsic values and had them submit what they thought their intrinsic values were. We got about 3,000 submissions, which we then deduplicated and categorized. So we were able to come up with 22 categories of intrinsic values. And later after the workshop, if you want, you can actually take our intrinsic values test. It helps you understand your own values. Uh, you can find it at this website. This leads to the next issue in decision-making which is that, so, okay, so you're trying to get to the top of the mountain, you come across this fork in the road and you say to yourself, okay, do I go to the left or do I go to the right? Well, if you zoom out a bit, well, you might discover there's another path you can take. The, the, this framing in terms of the dichotomy of left or right is often a false framing. And so this is mistake number three, narrowness, which is that we just don't consider enough options. And actually just a quick anecdote about this, we ran a study where we were bringing people through a decision-making tool we made called Decision Advisor, which you can actually try after the workshop if you want. It's a free tool on clearthinking.org. Decision Advisor, if you want to find it. Uh, but basically what we did, we had two arms in the study and one group, we said, hey, you know, you've already come up with the options for your decision, but we suggest you try to come up with some more because people often do this thing, narrow framing. In that group, essentially nobody came up with any more options. They were, they were just too lazy about it. The other group, we said, okay, we're not gonna let you continue in the study until you come up with more options for what to do. And remarkably, I mean, it was a small study, so take it with a grain of salt, but remarkably about 20% of the people in the arm of the study that we made come up with more options ended up choosing one of those new options they hadn't come up with before as their, their final result. And so one way to think about this is the, the choice you make cannot be better than the best option that you consider. So you might have a, a good example of this, which would be, should I quit my job or stick with it? Well, that, those really might be your only options, but on the other hand, maybe you can renegotiate some aspects of your role and change the nature of your work. Or maybe your company has internal transfers, or maybe you could maybe drop down to part-time if your company offers that. So often there are just more options than we, than we really think there are. And so the solution is really simple. Just brainstorm more options. 
put in the time to come up with more options for what you might do. Some of them might be dumb, but then you can quickly eliminate the bad ones, but you might discover options that are better than the ones you have. All right, now you suppose that you're on this path. What do you do? Well, 99.99% of people are just gonna keep walking straight, right? They're just gonna follow the path. But in theory, you don't have to do that. You could diverge, you could go to the left or to the right. You could, you could leave the path. And this leads to mistake number four, defaulting, where we're not even thinking about making a decision. We don't even realize there is a decision to be made at all. We just do things the way they've always been done. Um, and so for example, have you considered the fact that you could probably, if you have a, enough savings in your bank account, you could probably just move to Bali tomorrow. Well, COVID restrictions aside. Now I'm not saying you should move to Bali, you probably shouldn't move to Bali, but the point is you probably could. Uh, there are so many more decisions available than we even think about. Um, we constantly could be making decisions that, that are not even on our mind. So this leads to uh, solution four, which is how do, how do you find more decisions to make, right? How do you make more decisions than you're making now? Well, you want kind of signposts that there's a decision to be made. So a problem that you've had for a while is a signpost that there's probably a decision to be made. So notice the problems you have. Don't get so used to them that you stop making decisions around them. Furthermore, you want to actually search for opportunities. A lot of people just wait for an opportunity to come and then they make a decision about it. Well, you can actually create opportunities. You can put yourself out there. And so basically, the gist of this is just try to make more decisions. Now, often when, when we're making decisions, we don't think about the fact that maps exist. But for almost any decision that you're thinking about making, almost certainly, there's something you could read about that type of decision, whether it's a blog post from someone uh, or maybe a book about that kind of decision, or maybe there's online advice from career coaches, like 80,000 hours website. So a very common mistake we make is, is basically guessing about the decision instead of reading about the path. We want to go look for maps that others have created that might be able to help us. And so an example is maybe you say, I want to be a biologist. Well, what does a biologist actually spend their time doing? You know, have you, have you wondered that? Have you read blog posts from biologists uh, about that? How much time do they spend writing grants? How much time do they spend dropping things into test tubes? You know, I don't know the answer to that. So solution five, just do your research, especially if it's a big decision. You know, if it's something small and unimportant, obviously you shouldn't bother to do research. But if it's a really big life decision, there's almost certainly something out there that's been written that you can learn from. And here's a related one, which is often we're making decisions, we do it alone. We don't, we don't, we don't think about the fact that there are others who can help us. And so this is mistake number six, which is soloing. So this means we're not asking for advice or we're not asking for help. And so a good example of this is people wonder, should I stay in academia? Well, have you talked to professors who are further along the path than you? What do they say about it? And perhaps even more importantly, have you talked to people that tried that path and left? We often have a, a huge amount of selection bias in who we talk to. You know, we're thinking about going to academia, we talk to professors, but we don't talk to people who tried to become professors or started becoming professors and then quit. So the solution is very, very simple. Ask people what they think. And I generally recommend talking to two types of people. The first type are those with relevant experience or, or the, you know, the content experts. The second type are people who are wise that know you well, people who you trust, you, you like the way they make decisions and they know you well. And you can ask them, you know, what would you do if you were me? How would you make this decision? But of course, at the end of the day, even though people can give you advice, you shouldn't do things because people tell you what to do. You should still make the decision on your own, but it's gonna be informed by hopefully their helpful advice. All right, so imagine that you've just spent hours trekking on this path to get to the top of the mountain and you unfortunately discover that it's filled in by boulders and you just can't go any further. So what would you do? Would you say to yourself, you know, I put you know, so many hours in this path, I might as well just sit here and stay here forever. Obviously not, right? Obviously in this embodied metaphor of trying to climb to the top of the mountain, we'd say, okay, clearly this path is not gonna take us anywhere. Let's go back. Even though we're gonna waste it a bunch of time, we gotta go back, right? And yet in everyday life decisions, we often make this mistake of looking backwards at the, the investment we put into this so far, rather than thinking about just the future. And so you wanna avoid what's known as the sunk cost fallacy, which you've probably heard about. Uh, so, so a simple example here is imagine you've already invested 500 hours in this project that you were really passionate about, but you realize that if you had the option to join the project today in the state it's currently in, if you weren't already working on it, you would not join it, right? 
So there's this asymmetry. It's like somehow you're stuck working on it, even though you would not decide to start working on it today in exactly the state it's in. So the solution to this is when you're thinking about a project you've invested a lot of time in and you're making a decision around it, be sure to consider only its future prospects. The, the past investments of time, energy, effort, they're already lost. Whether you continue with the project or not, you're never getting that, those past investments back. So you have to just consider, what are the future prospects of this project? Would I join this now in the current state it's in if I wasn't already working on it? Or am I just working on it because it's a default and, it, and if I stop working on it, I have to admit that I've wasted all that time and energy. Now, inevitably, if we're trying to do difficult things, there's going to be some paths that frighten us. Uh, the, some paths that, are, that we find really difficult. And one of the biggest mistakes people make is they hide from these difficult paths. They choose what's safe, they choose what's easy, they choose what's, what's le less scary over the right choice. You know, I'm, I'm sure many people can relate to the idea that there might have been someone that you wanted to have coffee with or have a call with who you didn't do it, you didn't ask them because of fear. Uh, maybe you thought they would not respond to you or turn you down. Um, but also, you probably know on some level that nothing really bad would have happened if you tried, right? So there's this disconnect between your system one fear of the situation, you know, that, that primate or animal part of us that's, that's saying, this is scary, and then your system two reflection that says, you know what, nothing really bad is going to happen. So you really want to be able to distinguish between things that feel dangerous but are actually safe and things that are truly dangerous. Obviously, there are plenty of truly dangerous things, and you shouldn't you know, rush into those, but there are many, many more things that seem scary, but are actually not dangerous. And so solution number eight, if you're a high anxiety person, it's absolutely critical to learn to push through fear. So I'm someone who tends to have a lot of worry and a naturally high anxiety personality. And I think I literally would have ruined my life if I hadn't at a young age learned to push through fear. So I just can't emphasize enough how important it is to not let fear stop you from doing the things that are important and valuable to you. More generally, Keep in mind that your ability to make good decisions absolutely hinges on your willingness to endure short to endure short term short term pain. Right, so many good things in life involve short term pain initially in order to get to the, the long term payout. You know, a classic example of this is like in breakups. Right, uh, you know, you're like, oh, you know what, the person I'm with is probably not the right person for me. But each day that goes by, you know, the easy thing, the low pain thing, is to stay with the person. Whereas breaking up is going to be painful, really unpleasant, really uncertain. And so there's a really strong tendency to delay and delay and delay. It's also important to remember, though, that sometimes you just need to relax. Sometimes you don't need to worry so much about the decisions you're making. You know, we think about life as a sort of linear path you're on, but it's actually really unrealistic. You know, you're, you're going to aim for that job you always wanted, and, and maybe you won't get it, but maybe you'll get something else that you're happy with. You know, maybe you thought you'd be married at a certain age, and, and maybe you'll be married later on. Maybe you thought you wanted a master's degree, and you get it, and you're like, you know what, that's actually not the thing I wanted. I'm going to go do another career path that doesn't even use my degree. And that's fine. This is just the nature of life. It's, it's highly nonlinear. These kind of narratives that we construct for ourselves often are, are really unrealistic. So this is mistake number nine which is overanalyzing, right? We obsess over a decision thinking this is gonna make or break our life. And you know, there are decisions like that. There are incredibly important decisions, but most decisions are not like that. And we also have to take into account affective forecasting where we tend to think that, that whatever we're thinking right now is gonna have huge implications on how happy we are and how we feel in the future. But the reality of the situation is that usually we're gonna be able to adapt to any situation. So. Most of the time, the decision is not as important as it, as it seems at that moment. So solution number nine, remember that most decisions are reversible. Uh, we'll have many opportunities, our path is gonna be nonlinear, and our decisions are never gonna be perfect. When, it, when it's not a super serious situation, just aim to be right most of the time. Being right most of the time is usually all that's worth investing in. If you try to get 99% confidence, you're probably gonna spend way too long working on that decision and you're probably going to burn up way too much energy and have way too much frustration. You know, being right most of the time is often the best that we can hope for. So with that, I'm going to do a brief Q&A and then we're going to get into the kind of workshoppy components. So anyone have questions, just quickly type them in the chat and, uh, and then uh, we'll, I'm going to break out for, for doing some activities.
So, uh, yep, just put them in the chat room there. Uh, yes, uh, I can. I can put the slide somewhere. It's no problem. Tips on pushing through fear, and anxiety. So that's so important. The first thing I would say is that if you think you might have an anxiety disorder, you know, if anxiety causes a substantial problem in your life, get treatment. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, I think the most evidence-based modality is cognitive behavioral therapy. There are other modalities that work for many people, but you know, if you just had to pick one, I'd go with cognitive behavioral therapy. But if you, that's not appealing to you, you can try like mindfulness-based stress reduction, um, and there's many other techniques. We also actually make an app for people with anxiety called MindEase, which you can check out. Um, let's see. Uh, other questions here. <laughs> Someone asked, can you give a brief overview of how your life worked out? Not really, uh, but, it, but it was lots of twists and turns, you know, lots of things I tried. I wasn't, wasn't really sure where I was going uh, and, you know, trying to be right most of the time and often being wrong. So the app, if someone asked for the app again, the app is called MindEase. M-I-N-D space E-A-S-E. It's, it, we make it help people manage their anxiety and symptoms. Do all bad decisions come from heuristics and biases? Absolutely not. Uh, you know, it, I suppose on, on some level, if we were perfectly rational agents, you know, with infinite computational resources, then we wouldn't make bad decisions. But the reality is a lot of times information is just fundamentally ambiguous. So there, you know, we have a limited amount of information. Um, you know, think about the game of poker, right? You can't always make a perfect decision. You don't always have perfect information uh, to act on. Furthermore, uh, a lot of times we, we have uncertainties even about ourselves, like about what we really want, what we're trying to achieve. So there's just kind of uncertainties on all sides. And you know, so even if you were extremely rational, you're still living in a world with uncertain, uh, uncertainty, imperfect information, and bounded computation, right? You can't spend forever, so you're still going to make a lot of mistakes. Uh, oh, another uh, anxiety recommendation that I have is the book When Panic Attacks. It's a really lovely book on uh, working on anxiety. Uh, someone asked, decisions are burning a lot of energy. Any tips on being efficient with the willpower one has? Well, one thing I like to do is I try to remove decisions I don't like to make. So, so as an example, I'm not a person who's really into clothing. If you're really into clothing, that's fine. That's great. You know, if you really enjoy like finding nice outfits and, and looking great, wonderful. You should make decisions about that. But if you don't care very much, then maybe you should just have, you know, 10 outfits that you just rotate, right? So um, obviously that's easier for men than women just because of societal expectations. But my point is that there are a lot of like smaller decisions that we can try to sort of automate. Another, another um, thing I do is I try to eat the same thing for breakfast every day, you know, just something reasonably healthy uh, so that I don't have to make that decision and I can focus on other decisions. Uh, the book is called When Panic Attacks. Okay, let's jump into the workshop components. 